Welcome in, everyone, and thank you for listening to the 283rd ever episode of the Missouri Sports Podcast, brought to you by 106 Apparel and recording from the MSP studio in beautiful Springfield, Missouri. I'm one of your hosts, Cameron Albert, alongside my good friend and fellow Mizzou fan, Kyle DeVries. How are you doing today, Kyle? Doing great, Cameron, on this incredible holiday, uh, Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Love's in the air. Um, Happy Valentine- Valentine's Day, producer Cameron. Thank you, thank you. Happy Valentine's Day to y'all as well. Can't believe I had to work today. Yeah. On this national holiday. holiday. Happy Valentine's Day to all the listeners and viewers. (laughs) We love you and we'll be your Valentine. If you don't have one, even if you do, if you need another one. Need a side piece? Yeah. We're here for that. (laughs) Uh, Did you have a good Valentine's Day? Uh, Yeah. Pretty normal day for the most part. (laughs) Other than just really thinking about how great Valentine's Day is. I think I think Emily was kind of hinting something at me when she said, uh, you're recording on Valentine's Day evening. None of you have plans. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, kind we of had, like no, hinting like, oh, we don't, all, we don't have plans. Oh, we made dinner plans for tomorrow night. So there you go. I prioritized you guys. You must be my actual Valentine's. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, you don't necessarily want to go out on Valentine's Day. That's, that's when everybody does or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to be an ordinary person. That's what I'm telling myself. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. You have to wait too long to get a table. Mm-hmm. The club is packed. It's just it's just an the arbitrary club. date. Is that is that your Valentine spot? You yeah, we always go to the club. <laughs> get bottle service. <laughs> um, you're you're having a happy Valentine's Day though because the Chiefs won the Super Bowl. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You take Monday off? Actually, yeah, I did because. Uh, Snow. Mm. Snow day. So I didn't, yeah. It was a snow day for me. Yeah. Uh, that was a heck of a game. It was incredible. It really came down to it. It was like really boring in the first half, but you could tell the teams, it was it, like those fumbles were just like yeah. derailing yeah. everything. Yeah. The teams were pretty amped, I think. Yeah. But yeah, like somehow like that was probably the most nervous I have been out of all three of the Super Bowl wins. Um, I was definitely like running around my house uh, <laughs> on that last play to for the touchdown so that was awesome and the story of the game has been overtime and the rules yeah. of overtime yeah you know, it like, seems like uh the chiefs have been the subject of a lot of like overtime debacles oh but, yeah 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 i mean honestly though this was pretty crazy like you know the first time a, a big rule change has been implemented and um i will admit obviously i'm not playing in the super bowl uh but i didn't know really yeah. the rules until they announced it and then you know the chiefs the time was expiring in like the quarter. That's what of, got me of overtime, yep. and I was like, "They have? Do they have to get this off? Like, is the game over here?" The, they were acting like there was not an issue, though. So right. I was like, "Okay, they must know. They what's must going know." On. And then Tony yeah. Romo was also kind of saying, yeah. "Like, it's just going to flip the quarter too." But I didn't really want to find out. Yeah. <laughs> and imagine losing the Super Bowl like that. You get the ball in like the three yard line, and the time just expires. Yeah, I mean, imagine losing the Super Bowl because you are just like did the exact wrong thing and chose to receive the overtime kick. Yeah, I feel like, and like an uh, hour or two before we started recording, I saw uh, like behind, I don't know, like mic'd up uh, audio from the overtime coin toss and the. Like Patrick Mahomes comes back to the Chiefs sideline from the coin toss saying they wanted the ball. Like the Chiefs were going to kick if they won the toss. And so they were the whole sideline was like fired up that San Francisco wanted the ball. Yeah. And they they've come out and said that they wanted that because they thought they wanted the ball third in case both teams scored touchdowns. Yeah. Well then you should have tried to get a touchdown. On your first yeah, drive. I think it's yeah. pretty obvious they yeah. didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. And uh, like multiple San Francisco players have said f- somewhat publicly that there was no discussion about strategy for these new rules or anything like that. There's a pretty good chance yeah. that none of the 49ers players knew the rules yeah. that had changed. Yeah. So. And uh, yeah. And the Chiefs already, they said like we were going to go for two. If, if a touchdown was going to tie the game, we were going to go for two to end it right there, which... Yeah. Like just thinking about it abstractly without even seeing it play out that it's like college overtime, you know, Mm -hmm. plenty of teams when you score second are just like, you know what, let's just put it all on this play and either win this or lose it and be done. Right. Yeah. Pretty wild that the first time those rules are ever going into effect, it's in the Super Bowl. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But that made it exciting for sure. I was 
a little, I don't know. I was kind of rooting for Christian McCaffrey a little bit, former Panther, which he had a pretty good game, but the fumble was pretty huge. But I'm glad the Chiefs won. <laughs> pretty sure Cameron mutes himself. <laughs> um, what all are we going to talk about this week? We're, we're going to talk about basketball a little bit, but mostly uh, we're going to talk about the NFL Combine, and then we are going to give out our football mizzou football players of the year awards which is something we just made up and we're gonna go class by class we're gonna go freshman sophomore junior senior and spotlight some of our favorite players from the season and that'll kind of give us a look at the future as well when we talk about the younger guys before we do all that don't forget to subscribe on youtube leave us a review wherever you listen to us and of course you can support us on patreon patreon.com slash missouri sports pod um mizzou basketball is giving us a break mercifully there is not a midweek game this week Uh, missouri lost to mississippi state 75 to 51 if anybody watched that it was a little bit of a mess uh you knew with mississippi state's defense that missouri is probably gonna struggle a bit and they're a bad matchup even if mizzou is good yeah and for the i don't know 20th game in a row the graphic came up on the screen that said Mizzou zero points in the last and I think it topped out at like seven and a half minutes of game time in this one. Yeah, Ev- it's like forty percent of the game. Every single game on this eleven game losing streak, there's that graphic has come up and it's been anywhere from like three to nine minutes. I don't know what like the low end threshold is of when they activate that graphic. It's got to be like <laughs> at least three minutes or Somebody's so. Somebody's like sitting there with a stopwatch. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it's like they haven't scored a field goal. Like maybe they've had a f- couple free throws. Yeah. But in this one, it was zero points in the last seven and a half minutes. Nice. So that's been something we've grown accustomed to seeing. There's only seven games left in this regular season. So that is good. And then Missouri can make a run in the SEC tournament. You know, anything can happen. Make a run in the transfer portal. Make a run in the transfer portal. Um, The college basketball coaching carousel might have officially kicked off with um, Chris Holtman getting fired at Ohio State. Yeah. Or their, uh, you know, parting ways. Usually parting ways. Of course, yeah. That is interesting that they did it so early in the season. Yeah. I feel like that's a little bit rare. bear it any longer. Yeah. Um, No idea about... Ohio State, I mean, they're having a bad season, but they're not even having as bad a season as Michigan this year. So but both are not too great. But I can tell you every single time a coach is not retained all across the country, I'm going to be going straight to Kempom, looking at their roster and seeing who might be available on the transfer portal. So I did that with Ohio State, and I found I found a guy that I want, <laughs> um, Coach Gates. Go ahead and check in on 6'11 sophomore Felix Okpara, originally from Lagos, Nigeria. Go ahead and check in on him. I would just go ahead and say if there's anybody over like 6'10 that's averaging like a double-digit number and either rebounds or points, I'll take him. I'll take averaging 20 minutes per game. But really, though, he's got an offensive rating of 118, blocks a lot of shots, um, not a stretch five. He's more of a traditional athletic big. No idea if Missouri will be interested in him, but they definitely should be. Do you think he'd be interested in Missouri, Cam? That's a question you should be asking. Is he interested in a family atmosphere and making some NIL money? (laughs) Because we can (laughs) offer both of those things. And can we, like convince him that this year didn't happen and look at the two players we put in the nba last year something like that ought to be able to get a couple guys in here um yeah so that's about all i have for basketball um missouri the rest of the season for missouri um i was looking ahead at the schedule and of the seven games remaining three of them are home games but two of them are to are against Tennessee and Auburn. And the third one is against, um, oh, sorry, Tennessee, Auburn, and Ole Miss. They play Ole Miss twice. That is the next game is away. At Ole Miss, 
and um, the most winnable game left on the schedule is maybe that one or at Arkansas in 10 days. So strap in. Oh, this is only this is not related to Missouri whatsoever. Okay. Um, but Jay at Jay Kuda on Twitter had an I posted an interesting interesting graphic uh, showing unranked teams at mm. home against teams ranked in the AP poll top ten, uh, dating back to the 2010 2011 season. Uh, before this season, every single year uh the winning percentage is like 30 percent or less for unranked teams beating top 10 teams at home Mm -hmm. this season obviously uh not finished but so far uh home teams unranked teams are winning uh 53 percent of the time sheesh uh so that's the only what was it just last year 24 percent wow basically every year before that is like 30 percent or less one of uh 2014 it's 16 percent did this person give any kind of rationale or expl- explanation for why this could no. be? Well, maybe, but I uh, took a screenshot of it. Oh, I see. So, <laughs> and saw it several days ago. Um, yeah, I mean, is that a combination of like it's, yeah, I mean, COVID it's, transfer stuff finally coming to an end this coming off season and NIL stuff? Yeah, I would say it's definitely players getting an extra year from COVID. So like kind of the experience is obviously almost objectively a good thing yeah well, the players playing longer and so pl- teams are older than ever and nil is you know bringing parity as well as also um transfer portal yeah so and when you know when guys are not playing they're just finding somewhere else to play where they can play yeah and so i think that's making the atmosphere a little flatter mm-hmm. which i think is great for the sport honestly i mean just it's just Missouri is obviously so incredibly irrelevant for yeah. anything this season, but on a typical year, I think that uh, that's a good thing, and it makes things a lot more interesting. That's I mean that's what college basketball has always had going for it, really more so than college football. Um, yeah, I'd love to see college football get more flat, but yeah. college basketball is still light years ahead in that regard. Right, and you know, with the national championship being a culmination of this huge single elimination tournament in college basketball. Having maximum parity creates more of these, you know, two seed upset, getting upset. I mean, yeah, we just recently saw the first one seed get upset, and uh, more of that stuff could be on the table for this coming yeah. tournament. Yeah, good luck filling out your brackets. Yeah, this year, <laughs> more parity um, than ever. It'll, it, yeah, watch it'll be like the most chalky <laughs> uh, tournament in the history. Um, we were talking about before we started recruiting, like <laughs> recruiting. Before, <laughs> you were recruiting, actually. You were uh, recruiting yes, that guy. Yes. Before we started recording, uh, we were looking at the Mizzou basketball roster. And I didn't know, if, I don't know if we were going to make this an on air segment, but I'm going to go ahead and pull the trigger on it. Um, who do you want back from this squad that has eligibility remaining? We agreed. Tamar Bates. It's like the only easy answer. Welcome back. That is literally the only easy answer. Out of everybody, that would be eligible. Yeah. So, yeah, if I could wave a magic wand, I sure, I'd take Sean East back. Yeah. But even that, even magic wand, I'm maybe only looking at those two guys. Yeah. And what I came up with was give me Tamar Bates and John Tanjay because he's the... Just because he's we the don't, most unknown. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know for sure that he's bad. Yeah. And you pretty much can't say that about anybody else. Yeah, I would take uh, Tamar Bates and maybe Jordan Butler. Yeah, that's just because maybe one of the, th- the freshmen. He has kind of a unique skill set, and I could see him becoming uh, something useful. Yeah. Um, Missouri's been without Caleb Grill, John Tanjay, and recently Trent Pierce. He's been out with illness. I'm pretty sure that's going to transfer itis. <laughs> now watch him have some actual like debilitating disease He's or an something. ear infection. Ear infection? Yes. Okay. That I've heard that called going to transfer itis. Yeah. Uh, so we've been without him. And then on top of all that, Sean East doesn't play against Mississippi State. That is the worst thing imaginable. Yeah. It was so bad. Yeah. I think you could play through an ear infection. 
Is that I, being insensitive? Well, you know, I have experience with ear infections, actually. I had chronic uh, ear infections as a child and had to have tubes in my ears. And absolutely, you can play basketball with an ear infection. <laughs> That's, I mean, I don't want to, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, you don't have to be out for five weeks straight? <laughs> I still swam that summer. I just had to wear a cap, mm. cover up my ear. It's a little different than basketball. Maybe you have to wear a cap, wear a swimming cap so like sweat doesn't get in there. <laughs> ear infections, you know, they can be a They're problem. Nasty. Yeah. You, you have to go to an ear, nose, and throat doctor. It's all connected. When I was a kid, I thought everybody went to the ear, nose, and throat doctor. That was not the case. Just me. Um, so I have that in common with Trent Pierce. I'm, I, yeah. Uh, good luck to anybody who, and I'm saying this to myself. Good luck to us the rest of the way as we watch these games. <laughs> All 12 of us. <laughs> uh, moving on to football, we have a little bit of news before we do our player of the year stuff. Uh, eight Missouri Tigers have been invited to the NFL Combine. And we've talked about this a little bit before, like kind of what our expectations were there. And I absolutely was not expecting eight Missouri Tigers to get invited to the NFL Combine. Yeah, I feel like um, usually we're happy if like one player goes to the NFL Combine. Um, and that's that's a pretty big honor yeah. to get invited to that. So, producer Cameron, eight. can you look up how many players go to the Combine? I feel total, it's like a little over two hundred, but that's a total guess. I, before seeing this, I would have said Darius Robinson, Javon Foster, Ennis Rigstraw, Chris Abrams, Drain. Yeah, I would have said those four. Yeah. Are I would expect them to get invited. Three hundred twenty-one prospects have been in, invited this year. Okay, yeah. Well, eight out of that many seems about right. Um, yeah. So the eight that have been invited are Darius Robinson, Tyron Hopper, Ennis Rakestraw, Chris Abrams, Drain, Jalen Carlisle, Cody Schrader, Javon Foster, and Harrison Mevis. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, we were talking about that. Is Harrison Mavis going to run the 40? Good question. I think he'll probably break every combine record in every event that he participates in. I couldn't agree more. Uh, yeah, combine's at the end of this month, and at the end of February. Um, I hope Ennis Rakestraw is going to be able to participate. I know he didn't play in the Senior Bowl because of an injury, but hopefully he'll be able to do the combine. Uh, yeah, I've been, um, I've been keeping track of uh, Pro Football Focus has been putting out their, like, top 100 players from this past season and it's not like strictly based on their uh rating system because they are weighting it a little bit based on position um and i saw they were like spotlighting um chris abrams drain and javon foster and it just never gets old seeing these players get shout outs from Mm -hmm. these major organizations and just being reminded how many great performances we saw this season. And I saw uh, Chris Abrams Drain getting talked about regarding his on field speed. Um, I saw a tweet saying that, that really stood out at the uh, senior bowl practices and how they were talking about him specifically. You don't always get to see how good a cornerback is in college because they're just not going to throw at him. And um, that really wasn't the case in the senior bowl and he was just able to show, you know, uh, elite closing speed on the field. So mm-hmm. I'm interested to see what his speed drills and 40 yard dash and that kind of stuff will be. Yeah. Cause that's yeah. something that could, when you have all the like film going your way, mm-hmm. putting up numbers and some of these drills can really cement you as like a day one yeah. guy. Yeah, for sure. Kind of putting all the puzzle pieces together. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I feel like Chris Abrams Drain was kind of the guy that, you know, this time last year, I was thinking he might be turning away, you know, a second, third round pick to come back. Mm-hmm. And uh, now we're talking about maybe Ennis Rakestraw being a first round guy. Yeah. I, I can, I'm consistently seeing him mocked in the, at the end of the first. Sometimes I think as high as like 24, 25. Mm-hmm. I've seen 27 a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that would just be fantastic for him. And, you know, some, I mean, you're getting drafted to, by some really good teams in that range. So, could be potentially joining a playoff team immediately. 
So, and same for Darius Robinson. You know, I think he, uh, I still would guess he's probably early second, but I've seen some stuff with him going late first as well. Yeah, we're going to talk about some of these guys, obviously, when we give out our awards here in a second. Um, but last guy I want to talk about, Cody Schrader. You know, like, just classic, once again. I, this time last week, would have said he's probably not going to get invited. Of course, he gets invited. Yeah. I'm going to say he's not going to get drafted. Watch him get drafted or, you know, sign with a team and make the uh, training camp roster and all that stuff. For sure. I mean, if you're getting invited to the Combine, at this point, you're getting drafted. Yeah. It's just a matter of where and who. Um, so these guys are all pretty much guys we're going to talk about in our awards section as well, most likely. Um, so let's move on to that. Uh, I figured we'd just organize this by class. So we'll start with freshmen and go through it like that. And this will be kind of an opportunity to reflect on the, the season a little bit and with the freshmen and sophomores, especially, uh, be able to kind of look at what's coming and, uh, compare it to some, uh, previous, underclassmen performances and we'll split it up between offense and defense so um starting with freshman defensive player of the year i feel like this was maybe one of the easiest ones to figure out because uh it's not often that freshmen get a ton of playing time on defense but marvin burks is the guy that i wrote down uh 16 total tackles including one sack and one fumble recovery um he was not relied upon a ton uh, in the biggest matchups this season, but he showed that and he returned some kicks as well. He showed that he's going to be ready to step up next year and be a guy. I think that's going to be solid in the defensive backfield for the next two seasons. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned it. Uh, it's, it's pretty rare for a true freshman to come in and, and make a difference and, and key plays, but he did that. And especially having, some talented guys in front of him too. Um, so it's not like it was like a wide open opportunity and right. he just played because he had to, like he kind of forced himself onto the field. Exactly. So. And he was a highly rated recruit too. So it definitely just feels like he's hitting all of the benchmarks as a, a classic, just uh, a hit so mm -hmm. far. Yeah. So love to see everything that we saw from him this year. Yeah. And um, we've, I feel like, you know, I'm thinking of like maybe like Isaac Thompson or somebody who was like pretty, uh, highly regarded prospect and played a bit but you know i f feel like we've seen some of these in-state defensive backs that come to mizzou but don't really do a whole lot yeah and so it feels good to see you know st louis kid uh, yeah showing up and, and just the nature of recruiting i mean you should almost just be approaching every recruit with that with that expectation in mind that it probably is not going to work out because yeah. most recruits don't work out exactly how you think they're going to uh so it's just makes it a plus whenever they come in and they're just exactly as advertised and they and they play right away yeah so bright future ahead for him for sure um uh, moving to the offensive side of the ball with the freshman obviously two guys really stuck out and so i don't know if we want to give one guy the nod over the other but we're talking about freshman wide receiver marquise johnson and freshman tight end brett norfleet so maybe I'll I'll uh, give you the stats on both of them, and maybe we can come to a decision on which guy we think the award should go to. Um, Brett Norfleet, 18 receptions, 197 yards, three touchdowns. I'm trying to remember some of his bigger plays. Um, he had a nice hurdle against uh, Florida in that game on a reception. Um, I can't remember what game he caught that sideline pass, immediately got hit, uh, it was kind of like a fingertip catch, and he was a little shaken up afterwards. It may have been. I feel like it was a pretty pivotal moment yeah, in the game. It feels like it was a big, a big play for sure. Uh, I can't remember. I know what exactly what you're talking about, and I can't remember either. He had two touchdown receptions against Arkansas, and when I think of Brett Norfleet, the 18 receptions for 197 yards, three touchdowns. That's not like anything crazy, but for a true freshman tight end to kind of show like. I'm ready to be the guy yeah. moving forward when Mizzou football has been kind of since like Alberto, Daniel Parker Jr. It's been a little bit like, do we, do we have much of a threat at tight end? Are we even trying to use them effectively because of what we're working with here? So Yeah, yeah I would say solid like five seasons with like basically nothing yeah. reliable at all at tight end. Um, 
So I would. That might be the most exciting thing about him, though, is like, okay, we got one. Seriously, just uh, yeah, it's just a great athlete. He is a great baseball player too. Yeah. Um. So, and he's like six seven, and just I, you know, we've talked about it before that tight end is one of maybe the hardest positions to get on the field early because your two primary uh, responsibilities are so polar opposite from each mm-hmm. other. You're you're having to block. Um. You know, like college level defensive linemen mm-hmm. and then also go out and like run routes yeah. and like catch passes and stuff i mean those are literally like just brute strength versus like finesse and yeah. you know just speed and just literally two polar opposite skill sets and you know they're having to learn so many like scheme fits and stuff so it's just it's it's a complicated thing to learn especially for young guys despite how talented or athletic they are yeah um so for him to come in and do what he did is just honestly um phenomenal and um you know, he, it's crazy. Like he was useful this season, provided something that we really, really needed yeah. um, to kind of complete the offense. But mm-hmm. when I think about his potential, it's kind of mind blowing um, yeah. how good he could be. <laughs> and if he stays on the path that he's going at. So I don't know, man. He, I mean, he's, he's got the potential to be one of the most special tight ends that Missouri has ever had. And I remember a few, on a few broadcasts, them, uh, the broadcast spotlighting his blocking in the run game later in the season, showing mm-hmm. him, you know, with a kick out block to spring Schrader for a big gain. Yep. So yeah, he figured out how to do both and yeah, very excited to see what he can do. And definitely when we're having this conversation, you know, two or three seasons from now about NFL guys in the NFL and stuff, I think he'll, he absolutely has the potential to be like a first round pick someday. Mm. Mm. I'm excited. Okay, so then we also have wide receiver Marquise Johnson had 13 receptions for 383 yards and three touchdowns. Uh, Some of his most memorable moments um, had a big catch in the Kansas State game. It was one of those uh, big completions that kind of got everybody excited about the offense in a hurry. A 76-yard touchdown reception against Memphis. Uh, Of course, the fake punt reception for a touchdown against Kentucky. Maybe the play of the year. And uh, one of my favorite plays of the year, the 50-yard reception in the bowl game against Ohio State yeah. to, uh, you know, show that uh, they didn't play any offenses this year. Yeah. And that's why they... Break know. Ohio State secondary. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. I mean, it felt like, especially, man, talk about forcing your way out of the field. Yeah. Uh, Marquise Johnson was the epitome of that. And uh, just bringing something, a skill set that nobody else on the team has, um, even Luther Burden or Theo Weiss, like he's got a next gear that I think uh, kind of a deep threat that maybe those guys don't even have. Mm -hmm. Um, He's truly special in that regard and just insane like top level speed and stuff. Um, It just felt like when we are in a bind and we just need a big play, like we're going to Marquise Johnson. Well, the bowl game, I think, was exactly that, where, like, the offense couldn't do anything, and we're watching the game, and I think I even said, like, we need uh, something over the top to Marquise yeah. Johnson. We got to do something here, get yep. it going. And that's what sparked the offense. Um, So I was, I was curious because, like, at least in recent Mizzou history, I feel like if I hear a freshman wide receiver, 13 receptions for a few hundred yards, this, like, kind of gaudy uh you know yards per reception number that's not uh that's not super foreign to us so i was looking back at some previous seasons um some kind of random names here that had a, not as good a seasons but in the ballpark um going back a few years dominic Jacinto, his freshman year 15 catches for 171 yards cam scott as a true freshman eight receptions for 214 yards and then J.J. Hester, 12 receptions for 225 yards. So it does make me a little nervous because there is precedent for a true freshman to make some big plays, have a big yards per catch number, and then you never see them again, basically. Um, it, but, but the point you're making about him being out there in so many crucial moments, I think, changes the... The framing there in my mind at least yeah. yeah who he's having to compete with snaps for yeah. the moments that he created in a special season it just feels like this is a little bit different mm-hmm. than somebody like cam scott mm-hmm. or somebody or something like or jacento or something like yeah. that yeah yeah again that 
his trajectory is like more intriguing, I think, just because, you know, how many different ways will they use him? Is he like, yeah, with the entire receiving core coming back of guys that uh, were impactful this season, you know, uh, is he going to have room? Probably he's not going to ha- exactly have room next year to do a whole lot more. Right. Yeah, it will be interesting to see how his role expands in the next few years. And uh, you're right. He might kind of just have that similar role where he just kind of breaks a drive because of a big play or something like that. And, you know, we'll take that. Um, but I'm sure he'd be happy to kind of show what else he can do. But for the sake of Missouri's offense, that's something he does better than anyone else. Um. A random name popped in my head. Now I want to see, I want to remind myself of his freshman year, Demetrius Mason. You remember? Uh, That's a deep cut. Yeah, I feel like he had a, uh, a pretty spectacular freshman season. What, what year would that even been? I'll tell you momentarily. <laughs> uh, let's see. His fr- his freshman season at Mizzou in twenty sixteen, he had forty seven receptions. For 587 yards and three touchdowns. I mean, I barely even remember that name at all. That's wild. Yeah. Do you know what he did after that? After uh, Mizzou? Like, where, where, did he transfer or something? He did. Uh, his sophomore season uh, only played in four games, 13 receptions, 119 yards, and then he has no more stats at any other school. Wow. I had a name. Okay. And then I forgot it. Ah. I'll think of it. Okay. Uh, so do, I'll let you decide. Who's going to get Offensive Freshman of the Year, Marquise Johnson or Brett Norfleet? Whatever factors in your mind go into it, that's what we're going with. I'm going to go with Marquise Johnson. Um, just because of the impact that he had in – getting us over the hump in the kind of those, some of the struggles that we had in a few of those games. Um, Really, truly some pivotal moments. Yeah. Yeah. And um, like I said, I I think, um, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, he just has a special skill set and I'm excited to see how they use him um, from here on out. And Norfleet, we're going to be able to be, he's going to be on this list for years to come. He's got the highest ceiling of maybe anybody (laughs) on the entire offense. So he'll, he'll be around. All right, moving on to sophomores. And because the who's in what class, how many whatever years of eligibility they have left is so confusing and frustrating. We've talked about that many times. I'm basing this off of how many years of eligibility they have left. Okay? Okay. So whatever the record books say, I'm going based off eligibility. And that means I'm considering... Yeah, who I'm proposing for defensive sophomore of the year is Dalen Carnell. I'm considering him a redshirt sophomore, which I think is accurate. I think he has two more years of eligibility. Dalen Carnell, this past season, 51 total tackles, including six tackles for loss. Three of those were sacks. One interception, that which was returned for a touchdown, and two forced fumbles. He was just all over the field making plays. Um... I I know he had tackles at the line of scrimmage um, that were not sacks or tackles for loss where he was blowing plays up. Sometimes he was in the backfield allowing a defensive lineman to make the play uh, because of the havoc he was creating. And more than anything with Dalen Carnell, I'm just so excited for next year for him. Uh, how he grows into the role uh, with players departing and – you know, him and Marvin Burks as the starting safeties next year? Yeah, I mean, he he's such a versatile player. Um, his skill set is, I mean, he can just do everything. And like, as you alluded to, he's he's in the backfield. He's making interceptions. He's in the secondary. You know, he's defending passes. He's doing everything. And for a defensive coordinator like Blake Baker, who's going to run a lot of four two five, and hopefully will um, still be running a lot of the similar schemes next year he's just a dream come true for uh like a secondary heavy scheme Mm -hmm. um because you can blitz him you can drop him back and you know he's might lead the team in tackles you know it's just he's he can do everything on the field yeah and um i didn't have anybody else in the 
that's a true sophomore, a redshirt sophomore that came even close to his production on the defensive side of the ball this year. Yeah. That uh, pick six against Tennessee was just iconic. Too. Oh yeah, it's just especially because it got captured in the in the mini movie. Yes. Like the the videographer was just in the perfect spot yes. and everything. But that kind of that shot of him just catching the ball perfectly in stride and everything will kind of just be stuck in my memory forever. Yeah, I feel like if I wanted to give an honorable mention um, on the defensive side of the ball, maybe uh, Drayden Norwood uh, was maybe one of the more unsung heroes of the defense, any of those uh, sort of second second string um, defensive secondary players, you know, with all the injuries that we dealt with and stuff, I feel like they uh, him, he was kind of an unsung hero in the defense. Yeah, he had to play quite a bit with Rake Straw being out at the end of the year, and I thought he played really well. And makes you feel better about Rake Straw and uh, KAD moving on. Yep. Now, offensive side of the ball, obviously the sophomore of the year can't be anybody other than Luther Burden, although I do want to carve out space for Armand Mimbu because what he's doing as a true freshman on the offensive line is very special and very exciting for the future. But Luther Burden, true true sophomore wide receiver, 86 receptions, 1,200 yards, and nine touchdowns. And I said before we started recruit, <laughs> 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 I said earlier, um, for Luther you Burden, did say that earlier. for Luther Burden <laughs> to his true freshman season and now his true sophomore season to come out and exceed expectations for what anybody could reasonably expect out of him, even as a, you know, five star, you know, top wide receiver in the class. It's just blowing, blowing me away. Yeah. Yeah, it was like after seeing his outstanding freshman year alongside a great wide receiver uh, in whatever his name is, mm-hmm. Dominic Lovett. Yes. Um, it was like, okay, well, here's like a reasonable step that Luther Burden can take. And he just smashed all expectations, yeah. like all reasonable expectations for what he should be doing his second year as a five-star recruit. Yeah. Um, he just destroyed it. He's legitimately pro- – he was pro- he was a top three wide receiver in college football this year, and mm-hmm. I think he'll be far and away the best wide receiver in college football next season. So exciting. Uh, do you want to say anything about Armand Membu? Yeah. I mean, just so solid. He's just a freak. He's uh, helping us establish that Lee Summit North Pipeline. Yes. And, man, offensive line is going to be fun to watch next year. Yeah. And uh, – yeah, he's just a, another guy who's like growing into the position and the opportunity in front of him and just like capitalizing on everything. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, was not called for very many penalties, which like on this offensive line this past season, um, that was a, a struggle at times. And it feels like he was not the culprit more often than not. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the rushing attack this season with Cody Schrader, who I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute. It's such a thing of beauty to watch uh, both an offensive line that's blocking well in the run scheme, but also a a running back that understands how to use those blocks to his advantage. Like it was just uh, literally a work of art watching uh, those two units work together. So our sophomores of the season, Dalen Carnell on defense, Luther Burden on offense with a big honorable mention to Membu. Now, moving on to the upperclassmen, a little bit more straightforward here. Um, Looking at the junior class, this is where I have Chris Abrams drain because he had one more year of eligibility, so I'm considering him a junior. Chris Abrams drain, 51 total tackles, four interceptions, and one forced fumble. And the thing you can't put a number on, him shutting down half the field in several games because opposing quarterbacks just didn't want to throw over there yeah yeah missouri's had a nice little lineage here of cornerbacks going back to like a caleb evans and annis rake straw chris abram strain those guys have been so consistent over the years and um yeah it's it really is uh fascinating to think 
like, oh, we'll avoid this future first round pick Ennis Rake straw, so we'll throw over to the side of the field. Okay, good luck with that. Yeah. Um, it's just what what do you what do you do when you're going up against these two cornerbacks? And um, I just I feel like Chris Abrams Drain, he's going to be kind of a personal favorite of mine for a while. Just you know, seeing his development through the years and you know coming in as a wide receiver. Yeah. And you know. I'm pretty sure he was a Barry Odom recruit. Mm, I think so, yeah. I mean, he's just he's been around a while. Yeah. And he's he's been through some stuff, you know, and he's uh he's stuck it out and really just he always had that skill set, but just kind of finding a way to to use it to his full potential and maximize it. It's been kind of awesome to watch. Yeah, and I, and we when we talked about the um NFL combine, we mentioned him obviously and the praise he's been getting in the NFL media and stuff, but that's only going to increase, I think as he goes through the combine as we get closer to the nfl draft when he does interviews and stuff i think his draft stock is only going to rise and we you did mention this earlier but how it's kind of flipped how they him and rake straw have just gone back and forth on like just praise being heaped on them and like their draft stock going up yeah it's been cool to watch so i felt like that was a no-brainer uh defensive junior of the year is going to go to chris abrams drain and another no-brainer, junior of the year on offense, QB1, Brady Cook. 3,600 total yards, 29 total touchdowns, and just did what he had to do to guide this Missouri team to 11 wins. Yeah, it does really just feel like that's about the best way you could put it, is he just he just did what he had to do. Yeah. And he didn't put up like insane numbers. Um, it wasn't always the most beautiful display of talent you've ever seen or anything like that. He had a stretch there in the middle of the season where yeah, he was kind of blowing me away. He was like pretty efficient yeah. and stuff. Um, but you know, he just kind of just did exactly what the team needed in that moment, whether that was you know using his legs more mm-hmm. or you know whatever, giving up his body, just diving yeah. for a touchdown, you know, whatever, that kind of stuff. Like he was, and he was the vocal leader in the, in the locker room and, um, just the guy that everybody wants to play for, um, and play alongside. Yeah. And, uh, I'll never forget the, uh, you know, the offense looking a little shaky to start the season, but then going crazy in the Kansas state game and then him getting banged up a bit in the Memphis game. And me going from, you know, two weeks ago thinking, well, I do not care if Brady Cook starts anymore. I am totally fine with handing things over to Sam Horn. Just see what else we have. Yeah, which in hindsight was foolish. But at the time, we didn't know any better. We were all thinking it. But then, uh, you know, two weeks later in the Memphis game, however long, it wasn't much long later. After that, the, in the Memphis game, Brady Cook is getting banged up, and it's like, get a like, just get out of this game with a win and keep our quarterback healthy. We need him for SEC play. Yeah, <laughs> and that yeah, switch in my mind, at flipped. least, was just like, uh, no, this is we need to protect Brady Cook. We need to get him sliding, running out of bounds, throw the ball away, quit getting hit. Yeah, yeah, it was it was definitely cool to see him kind of persevere through through everything and through the entire fan base doubting him i mean don't lie you were there we were there um it was it was honestly sam horn uh season the whole off season for this podcast i'm yeah okay, we'll be honest i mean uh so for brady cook to kind of come in and do what he did despite all of that just kind of block out the noise even with a slow start um, pretty amazing yeah we won't make that mistake again no i don't think we will yeah now coming into his senior year it's like uh you know, I'm going to be pulling up the record books and seeing like, okay, what does another 3,600 yards do for some of these all-time records? Because he's been around a while and played in quite a few games now. Yeah. But uh, yeah, to to think that the, the with what we have coming back on the offensive line, the receivers coming back, Brady Cook coming back, having a healthy offseason, like the only question mark is running back. And that feels like the way coach drink has just made something happen at running back every year almost probably this, the easiest to replace position on offense too yeah this offense is going to be exciting once again and like uh not losing uh kirby Moore so far 
Um, yeah, seriously. I thought we were like beyond all of this. <laughs> yeah, and, like, uh, yeah. So juniors of the year, Brady Cook on offense, Chris Abrams Drain on defense. That takes us to the senior class. Starting out on defense, um, I think this is a fairly easy one. Uh, honorable mention to Jalen Carlisle, Darius Robinson, heart and soul of the defense, team captain. Came back for another year when he was, you know, uh, had some NFL prospects and to do what he did, you know, he's rocketing up every draft board and switching positions yeah. in the off season. And, and uh, the combination of him up front with the stellar defensive backs opposing offenses were struggling this year. Yeah, I think that's another one where it's like, uh, think about where we were with Darius Robinson you know, even four or five months ago, we yeah. were, you know, he was probably going to play defensive end um, just kind of because he had to. And we just kind of had a black hole there. And it was like, all right, that's not his natural position. I hope we're not kind of wasting his gift of playing more on the interior. Mm-hmm. Uh, but man, did he make that? <laughs> you know, I mean, he did, he figured it out. He said, it'll be okay. Don't he even said, He said, don't even, don't even worry. <laughs> I, I got this. And um, yeah, I mean, this, this time last year, he probably would not have even been drafted if he had gone to the NFL. I think that was something he kind of explored and didn't like what he heard, so he came back. And, man, did he make the right decision. And it's, you know, we were talking about it before we started recording that, not recruiting, but recording, that it's <laughs> it's really kind of rare for a guy to take the path that he took as far as, like, the NFL hype he's getting now because, you know, he's played five college seasons. He's a little bit older prospect. So for someone to go from nearly undrafted to, you know, getting first round hype, that's just really, really rare. Um, But that's just how special of a season he had. And I think also just the kind of the intangibles that come with him. And I think at the Senior Bowl, he showed his natural leadership. I think like Brady Cook, he's a guy you want to play with. You know, he's going to play hard every single down, whether it's, you know, a national championship or the Senior Bowl or, you know, whatever. He's just, he doesn't know it anything else he's just gonna give it his his all all the time and so yeah i think again a great story of perseverance and having to adjust and just knocking out of the park yeah and as we look as we get closer to the draft i mean he's another guy who i think he's going to test well and his measurables are there i think he'll do really well in interviews and yeah i mean feels like second round pick at worst i agree okay last decision to make we're down to senior offensive player of the year. This feels like a no-brainer, but these guys are so connected in how they complemented each other. I'm talking about Cody Schrader and Javon Foster. So Cody Schrader, 276 carries, 1,600 yards, 14 touchdowns. He is now the single-season rushing record holder for the University of Missouri. It, that is undeniable. But then n- that's not possible without Javon Foster doing what he did all season long. Yeah. Yeah, Javon F- Foster is amazing. And to have a solid left tackle that you never have to worry about uh, what he's doing over there, um, your your blind side is taken care of. I mean, that's just such a big deal. Um, and it, it's... Uh, Offensive lineman, similar to cornerback in the way that it's like, if we don't hear about you, yes, that's the best possible thing that can happen. You're yes. not getting flags. You're not getting our quarterback sacked. Yes. You're just doing a great job playing and play out. And that's exactly what Javon Foster has been for really two or three seasons now. Um, so losing him will be unfortunate. I think they'll find a good replacement for him. Is Caden Green going to play left tackle? I don't know. Well, what, whoever it is, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be... Some big shoes to fill, but yeah, I think uh, Cody Schrader though is might have had one of the best single seasons we've seen from Missouri Tiger in a, in a long time. Yeah, yeah, the award has to go to him. But again, he doesn't do that without the offensive line doing what they did, and uh, that's true. You can't uh, Foster was like probably the most he he uh, just like anecdotally from memory he probably was flagged a couple more times than Mimbu was, uh, but he definitely wasn't flagged the most on the offense this season. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's hard to sort of analyze offensive line other than looking at, looking at what they allowed Cody Schrader to do 
and the time that they gave Brady Cook in the pocket, um, his and you know that that showed up in Brady Cook's stats as well. The offensive line's stats show up in quarterback and running back stats, basically. Yeah. Yeah, when you have an offensive line like we had this year, it just elevates everybody, yeah. and we definitely saw that. And it feels like we're going to be in a good spot there this coming season as well. Um, Cody Schrader, though, it was like a meme at, at one point on, on the podcast where every game we get to the fourth quarter, and he was out of his longest run of the game in the fourth quarter. But he was literally just putting games away multiple times. And again, in the bowl game, he did exactly that. Like yeah. they relied on him uh, down the stretch to punch it into the end zone, and like a legendary game for him against Tennessee, uh, over a hundred yards uh, receiving, and yeah, just it started to like feel like the expectation every game. Yes, that's just like he's just gonna do his thing. Yes, yeah, yeah and, and I and I would say that it made it did make me a little bit nervous at times, like how much we were relying on him and we, yeah. we'd talk about it week to week like yeah how can this go on this this can't keep happening where yeah he's getting every single carry and we're talking like you know 30 plus carries yeah yeah it was like mid-season where i was saying yeah. like not this, sustainable this <laughs> cannot happen yeah. like we have got to figure out how to get nate pete involved or yeah. whoever and I think they ramped it up more yes. after we were saying those things. Yes. Like, no, we're actually going to give him 100% of the carries. Yeah. And, and they, he'll get he'll get better as the game goes on. Yes. Yeah, better as the game goes on, more effective as the season went on. And, um, yeah, I could just watch his highlights from this year all day long. Yeah. And just the way he would set up blocks, the way he would be patient in the backfield, allow defenders to overplay for, to get those cutback lanes. Yeah. Just... Mm, chef's kiss perfection it's beautiful yeah there are like th- there are a few things in in sports that are just like a thing of beauty like a home run like mm-hmm. a like a albert Pujols swing Oof. Oof. or you know something like or i don't know a big dunk or something yeah. like that but also just a running back just hitting a hole and just like exploding through the line of scrimmage and just yes. getting into the secondary like oh man that's just it's just beautiful yeah for basketball give me like you know that I'm imagining like the the San Antonio Spurs or something in their heyday, like with just like this crisp ball movement for a yeah. wide open three or wide open dunk. Oh yeah, yeah. When it's that those teamwork aspects in basketball and football, when everybody's on the same page and it results in just perfect execution. Yeah, seeing that in the running game this year. Yeah, just I love beautiful. seeing like the running back just flying through all the all the bodies and yeah. just nobody's touching him, just yeah. perfectly hitting all the holes. And I feel like with Schrader. You know, we, we talk about all these things that running backs are supposed to do. Another thing that he did consistently well is always falling forward. Like, he very rarely got tackled for a loss, and he would make sure that a uh, tackle at the line of scrimmage was, you know, he's getting that half yard or yard to just get something going forward. Mm-hmm. Definitely a legendary Mizzou football season um, all around, but especially for Schrader. And that's why he is our... Uh, offensive player of the year for the senior class and Darius Robinson on defense. Yeah. I feel like we should uh, also mention um, Tyron Hopper as yeah. the senior, yeah. senior uh, defensive yeah. honorable mention. Yeah. Yeah. Just literally also a definition of consistent. Yes. And um, obviously his numbers were hurt by him being injured uh, yeah. down the stretch, but uh, yeah, definitely solid honorable mention there. Okay. What do you think? Let me think of like three or four uh, options here. We okay. kind of talked about probably most of them, but as for like the play of the single play of the year, I mean, we've got Mevis drilling the field goal. The what was it, sixty yarder against Kansas State for the win. We've got um, Marquise Johnson in the fake punt, fake punt for a touchdown. Um, I would throw in the, what was it, like 4th and... Yeah, 4th and 17. 17 against Florida. I feel like those three those, those are, are like elevated, Yeah, maybe. There's probably maybe one more somewhere in there. I think... You're asking me which one I like the best? What do you think was the play of the year? 
Um, I think I got to go with, I think I got to go with the Mevis kick because it felt so improbable, but like if anybody was going to do it, it's him after the penalty moves him back to record breaking range and the whole attitude around the Kansas state game, like it was not an optimistic situation yeah. going into that game. Yeah. That's the, and then that will just make me remember like the offense waking up. Right. And sort of showing like, oh yeah, we've, we've got some stuff, you know, we, we're, we've been playing chess <laughs> and I have, I think for me personally, when I think back to this season, the Mevis kick might be the thing that stands out. I was going to say that too. They um, rush the field. It's it, a legendary. Like, yeah. And if he misses that, they still, they tie, right? It's overtime. Yeah, it goes into overtime. So, I mean, when you're thinking about like the importance to the season, like in a very black and white way, the fourth and 17 might have to Mm. be your choice. I don't know. Uh, As like, if they don't get this, they lose. Yeah. They don't go to uh, New Year's Six Bowl. Yeah. Whatever, whatever. Yeah. But the top play of the season, as far as like my favorite play, I think I agree with you, is is Mevis drilling the field goal and. It just felt like that wasn't supposed to happen. No. Like, it felt like something changed in that moment where, uh, I don't know, uh, it felt like this is not the Missouri team that we have seen yeah. in recent years. This is this is something different. Right. In hindsight, it was like, okay, this team's not going to just go 500. Yeah. And I think potentially that was the moment that the team was like, okay, we knew this was possible. Now we've seen the first step, you know. Yeah. And now it's yeah. I mean, now it's now it's something we've seen that we can do that we just need to go out and do again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've already offered up the embarrassing information that I was like literally moved to tears in <laughs> in that moment, just thinking like, oh my god, like this do- this doesn't happen. Yeah. And I kind of feel like all three of those plays are a little bit that way, yeah. where it's like to have three of those in one season yeah. is pretty insane yeah it was yeah the the fake punt when it came in that uh kentucky game was just like that was the one where we we didn't know how big it was at the time but looking back it's up there for sure with 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 those other two plays that's just as important yeah i feel like we're just like very lucky to have three plays that we can go back to at any moment for the rest of our lives just to like get that hit yes (laughs) it's just like i can't believe that went our way yeah (laughs) all right we did our uh, players of the year at each class, offense and defense. Talked about our favorite plays. Um, and uh, spring games right around the corner. Yep. No basketball games anymore for the rest of the for the rest of the year, season. Hopefully. Spring games. Next <laughs> next big thing coming up. Missouri's going to win a basketball game one of these days. It might not be In the calendar year of 2024, yes, I agree. That's true. It, and it may not... You know, you got to play a bad team in... No, we don't even get a guarantee of playing like Vanderbilt in the SEC tournament or something. Uh, special thank you to our Patreon supporters, the $10 level and above, Britt Treese, Brian Smith, Ryan D. Moore, Tristan, Ben Smith, Parker, Daddy JD, Tim Keens, Tyler Harsel, Brandon Groffler, Brandon Hanks, Matthew Tilly, Louis Hernandez, and Joshua Jacobson. Thank you. Gentlemen. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, we love you. You can find this podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We're on Twitter at Mizzou Sports Pod. And you can email us at Missouri Sports Pod at gmail.com. You can find our t shirts and stickers on our online shop, Missouri Sports Pod.bigcartel.com. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for being our Valentine. We'll see you next week. <laughs>